On Monday, the U.S. Army announced that Bell's V-280 Valor has won the contract to replace its legendary but aging fleet of Black Hawk helicopters. Almost immediately, I received a wave of questions about how this could possibly be the right answer. Are tilt rotor aircraft even safe? How can this replace the Black Hawk? I set out to find answers to your most pressing questions, so let's dive right into this. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. The V-280 Valor is designed to serve as a medium-lift infantry utility platform that could offer a huge leap in capability over the Black Hawk in a number of important areas. With a top speed of 305 knots, that's right around 350 miles per hour, the Valor can best the Black Hawk's top speed by more than 100 miles per hour, and all while offering a combat range of around 900 miles. That's between two and three times that of the UH-60. And believe it or not, it promises to do all that while carrying as much as 25% more weight. Much of that performance is thanks to the V-280's tilt rotor design, but it's that very tilt rotor design that has led many to wonder if this platform could be more trouble than it's worth, pointing to the Osprey's reputation as a dangerous troop transport for the U.S. Marine Corps to justify their position. And this is where I want to address the subject of bias, because to be frank, I had my own coming into this story. The MV-22 Osprey entered service for the Marine Corps during my time in boots, and it didn't have the best reputation. That reputation has permeated through to today, and you can find it in the comment section below just about any story or video on the Valor that has gone up in the past week. But we all know that reputations aren't always based in reality. So I went diving into the data to see if the Osprey's dangerous reputation can be substantiated by the numbers, and more importantly, to see if tilt rotor aircraft themselves are problematic. But safety's not the only concern that many have voiced about the transition to a tilt rotor platform like the Valor. The other prominent question is all about footprint. The V-280 Valor is significantly wider than the UH-60, leading many to question whether this aircraft can land close enough to the fight to really do its job. So I set out to find answers to these questions, as well as to assess the Valor's stated strengths and see how they could come in handy in a 21st century conflict. But I want to be clear right up front. I can't say with 100% certainty today that the V-280 Valor is the perfect choice for the U.S. Army. It's just too early in the program's development. But what I can say is that it does seem awfully promising, and it's worth us withholding judgment until this program matures a bit more. The Army is the world's largest operator of H-60 helicopters, with more than 2,100 platforms in active service, and that makes this contract decision absolutely monumental, regardless of which platform won. But thus far, the Army has kept most of the details about both the FLRAA program and the Valor itself fairly close to the chest, which means we may need to make some research-based assertions to answer these questions. And I want to point out that the Valor is in active development. Thus far, there's only been one prototype to fly, which means what's true about the V-280 today may not be true in five years or 10. In other words, keep your grains of salt handy. The first thing that we need to address is the fact that the V-280 and the V-22 Osprey are very different platforms, despite the fact that they leverage the same basic approach to aviation. A tilt rotor aircraft is, at its most simplistic levels, a combination of helicopter and airplane design elements meant to give operators the basic utility of a rotorcraft alongside the greater speeds and ranges allowed by a fixed-wing aircraft. This is accomplished via powered rotors that are mounted on rotating nacelles at either end of a fixed wing, with the props pointing up for vertical takeoff and landing or hover operations, and forward during sustained flight. The biggest difference between the Valor and Osprey is their size. The V-280 was designed from the start to support infantry operations, whereas the V-22 is considered a medium-to-heavy assault support and utility aircraft. 
In practical terms, that means the Osprey's a lot bigger. It's capable of carrying as many as 24 troops, while the Valor is limited to just 12. That difference in purpose also manifests in the doors used in each aircraft's design. The Osprey leverages a larger rear cargo ramp, while the V-280 has sliding six-foot doors on either side, more like the Blackhawk. But what may be the most important difference between these designs isn't quite as conspicuous. It's all about the engines. The V-22 Osprey's engines actually rotate in the nacelles at the ends of the wings, but the V-280s don't. Instead, the engines stay in place, and just the props and the drive shafts tilt. According to Bell, this will dramatically reduce the maintenance woes associated with tilt rotor platforms, driving down maintenance times, increasing aircraft availability, and reducing costs overall. And while we're talking engines, you should know that the V-280's props are actually connected via a shaft, which means if one of the engines fails, the other engine can power that failed engine's prop at a reduced rate, allowing for an emergency landing. But now that we've got the basics, let's dive into safety, because the biggest concern flooding the comment sections beneath our stories about the Valor so far have all been about the V-22 Osprey's reputation as an unsafe platform. Now, the truth is, the V-22 Osprey has seen a number of high-profile incidents that led to the deaths of service members. The first fatalities associated with the Osprey program came in July of 1992, when seven Marines were killed in a crash before the platform even entered service. Eight years later, another Osprey crash would claim 19, and in all, 51 service members have died in Osprey crashes throughout the program's lifetime, with the most recent coming in just June of this year, when an Osprey belonging to the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing crashed in California, taking five Marines with it. Now, every service member lost in training or in combat is a tragedy. But in order to determine whether the V-280 is an unsafe replacement for the UH-60, it's important that we try to view these tragic events through a sometimes difficult to muster lens of objectivity. Fatalities are just an unfortunate fact of life in military aviation, regardless of platform or environment. And while there's a valid argument to be made that many of these deaths could have been avoided through either better training or maintenance practices, the Osprey certainly isn't alone in its mishaps. According to the Project on Government Oversight, between 2013 and 2020, 224 service members died in different aviation accidents across the DoD. And despite the Osprey's bad reputation, you won't find its incident record as a dangerous outlier in either service-wide or branch-specific data. As Marine Major Jorge Hernandez, spokesman for Marine Corps Aviation, explained earlier this year, the MV-22 Osprey has a lower mishap rate per 100,000 flight hours than the Harrier, the Super Hornet, the F-35B, or the Super Stallion, just to name a few. And even that 51 service members lost in Osprey crashes during its first 33 years of flight isn't much of an outlier either. In the Black Hawk's first 33 years of service, more than 180 service members and civilians died in non-combat-related crashes. But that can also be a bit misleading. It's important to remember that the Black Hawk existed in much higher numbers than the Osprey during these respective periods of time. And I wasn't able to find accurate data on the UH-60's mishap rate per 100,000 flight hours that early in its lifespan. I did, however, find plenty of evidence that the Black Hawk suffered from its own early setbacks. I'm going to give you this information with as much context as I can so you can decide what you think of it for yourself. In April of 1985, six years after the Black Hawk entered service, the Army grounded its 630 UH-60s pending an investigation into its 37th death across 23 crashes. Three years later, in 1988, the fleet had grown to 970 Black Hawks, but an additional eight crashes had brought its death toll up to 65, or more than the Osprey has in all. Now, troubling as that sounds, it's important to note that 970 is about double the Osprey fleet, so the Black Hawk probably still had a pretty good mishap rate. In fact, in March of 1988, after that 65th death, the Army stated in simple terms that the Black Hawk was still the safest helicopter they had ever flown. 
That, in large part, is thanks to the fact that the Black Hawk was not the Army's first helicopter. It was designed leveraging lessons learned from hundreds of thousands of flight hours in less resilient platforms, like the UH-1 Iroquois. In other words, the Black Hawk's helicopter technology was just a lot more mature when it entered service than the Osprey's tilt-rotor technology. The point here is not to suggest that the Black Hawk was or is an unsafe platform, but rather to point out how these sorts of tragedies are, to some extent, inherent to military aviation. So, if the Osprey has a better mishap rating than all sorts of platforms, ranging from the Navy's C-20 passenger jets to the Marine Corps' KC-130 tankers, why do we perceive it as such a dangerous platform? Well, it seems to me that there are a few factors at play here. The first may be recency bias. The V-22 only entered service in 2007, which compared to the decade-spanning careers of its peers, makes it a relative baby. Aircraft, like people, often only get one shot at a first impression, and the Osprey's early crashes definitely left their mark. The second variable to consider is the Osprey's utilitarian role as the Marine Corps' workhorse troop transport. When a fighter jet goes down, you might see one or two fatalities, but when an aircraft carrying two dozen Marines goes down, the death toll can be much higher. So although the Marine Corps Super Hornets may go down at twice the rate of the Osprey, they still result in fewer fatalities. And that leads to a sort of survivorship bias in media coverage. And what I mean by that is that I can tell you from my own experience as an aviation journalist that a story about a T-38 Talon going down and killing an instructor and student won't get much coverage in mainstream media, and the story itself won't do a lot of traffic. But a story with a double-digit death toll in the headline will drive more clicks and more comments and more engagement, and thus more exposure. And mainstream outlets know that, so they will highlight these stories whenever they get an opportunity. Now that's not to say there's a nefarious motive behind covering a crash that kills two dozen service members. Of course not. But I am pointing out that this plays into our perception of the Osprey as it compares to other aircraft. The fact of the matter is, the data says the Osprey is a rather safe platform, but we perceive it as dangerous. More dangerous, in fact, than a number of other aircraft that actually have a worse mishap rating per 100,000 flight hour. Now, I certainly can't say whether the V-280 will prove to be safer or less safe than the Osprey, but I can say that like the Black Hawk, it benefits from not being the first of its type, so if I were going to place a bet, I'd bet on the V-280 being even safer. All right, enough about safety. Let's talk footprint. The V-280 Valor is undoubtedly larger than the Black Hawk it'll replace, with a wingspan of nearly 82 feet compared to the H-60's very slim waistline of just 7 feet 9 inches. The Valor is, however, quite a bit shorter, measuring in at about 50 and a half feet long, compared to the Black Hawk's nearly 65 feet. When you compare them in that way, it does make the Valor seem huge in comparison. But if you turn the Valor 90 degrees, that size disparity becomes less pronounced. There's no denying that the Valor's wide stance could potentially limit its ability to land in tight spaces, something many have voiced concerns about. But Bell believes that the benefits of the tilt rotor design outweigh any potential limitations. I'm going to quote Keith Flail, Bell's Vice President of Advanced Tilt Rotor Systems. The V-280 has a slightly larger footprint than the UH-60. However, you get speeds and ranges to fight against near-peer threats with unprecedented operational productivity. You can't win the fight unless you're in the fight. Flail goes on to give the example of a soccer field, saying that you may only be able to fit 10 V-280s, whereas you could squeeze in 12 Blackhawks. But Flail points out that despite that limitation, using the V-280 would allow you to launch these missions from twice as far away, while flying at twice the Blackhawk speed throughout. That added speed and range could prove more beneficial than landing in tight spaces if the U.S. finds itself in a fight with China. That's something Bell seemed acutely aware of when they prepared this graphic that compares the V-280 Valor's range to that of the UH-60 in a variety of Pacific locations. 
And while the Valor may need to choose its landing spots more carefully, that added speed and range could lead to saved lives when using this as a medevac platform. Within the medical community, the first hour after a serious injury is sustained is referred to as the golden hour. If you can get a wounded warfighter to advanced medical care within that golden hour, their likelihood of survival increases dramatically. And even after the golden hour, the sooner you can get on the surgeon's table, the better. The Valor's ability to move at more than double the Black Hawk's speed and fly at more than double the Black Hawk's range could both pay huge dividends in terms of troop survival, at least according to Bell. And that logic holds up for me. So does all this mean that the V-280 really is the perfect choice for the army? Well, as I said at the start, it's really impossible to say at this early stage of the Valor's lifespan. In fact, at this point, we can't even say for sure what the Army thinks its needs really are. When asked for specifics about what prompted the Army to choose the Valor over Sikorsky and Boeing's Defiant X, Major General Robert Barry, the Army program's executive officer for aviation, offered what basically amounted to a really wordy wink and a shrug. I'll quote him here. Can we be more specific on the factors of how exactly we arrived at this point? No. However, best value is meant in the truest sense that it was a comprehensive analysis of a variety of factors. No one really drove that decision. So if you look broadly at a very high level, the factors are variables and performance, cost and schedule. All were considered. And the combination of those are defined explicitly and evaluated. That is what I would describe as the best value, and what the Army would describe as its best value selection. That is the longest paragraph that said nothing I have ever read to you on this channel. And considering how I'm prone to droning on, that's saying something. But what I can tell you for sure is that the V-280 Valor benefits from literally hundreds of thousands of flight hours worth of experience derived from the V-22 Osprey. And the prototype that's been used for testing has already exceeded expectations. After all, the 280 in its name was meant to represent 280 knots, only for the prototype to cruise all the way up to 305 knots in testing. That first prototype racked up about 200 hours of flight time between 2017 and when Bell retired it last year. The Defiant X is still flying, but it has yet to match the Valor's 200 hours in the sky due in large part to delays related to its rotor blade and transmission system. The contract awarded to Bell is good for $232 million, with options that range up to $1.2 billion. But even then, the result won't be a fleet of new aircraft. It'll be a more thoroughly designed and tested platform that's then ready to move into production. In other words, this program is still very much in its infancy. Will the V-280 eventually prove its doubters wrong and go on to earn its place atop the legendary Army aircraft podium alongside the likes of the UH-1 or the H-60? The truth is, no one can say. But what we can say is that the Pentagon believes the Valor has what it takes to be the future of Army aviation. And if they're right, the V-280's combination of speed, range, and utility could offer a huge leap in capability for America's infantry troops all throughout the 21st century. Only time will tell whether or not that's actually the case. And on that ends another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.